Hey there. Hi. How are Hello. you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. So, yeah, how are you feeling? I know that this is a lot. You're doing like, you know, nonstop MCAT stuff and then working and then coming back after work doing MCAT stuff like right away. Or how are you feeling in terms of like burnout and stuff like that? I feel like yesterday was pretty tough Mm -hmm. for me, uh, but it was just a long day in lab. I spent like five hours dissecting under a microscope. Okay, okay. Um, today was a bit better. I feel I have a bit more energy than yesterday. I was exhausted last night. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So, okay, that's, yeah. that's good to hear about today then. Um, all right, yeah. What do you want to go over today? Um, so I was thinking I want to do chemphys, but um, maybe it's good to switch gears a bit and do uh, one of the bio biochem sections from mm -hmm. Blueprint. Because I've only been doing like, uh, what is it? Uh, the U world for chemphys and like reviewing chemphys blueprint. So I guess we should switch gears a bit. Sure, sure. Got it. Um... Let me pull it up because I had pulled up Kempis and now I changed my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Here it is passage nine. Okay. Okay, let me pull that up there and I can also pull up the answers right next to it. Okay, so. um yeah okay so should i read it should we do that uh like going through the passage mm -hmm. um so ai is a disorder of tooth development several phenotypes result from different abnormalities such as deficiencies in animal formation ossification or tooth maturation okay in patients with ai the teeth are usually small fragile grooved and abnormally colored Study was designed to identify candidate genes and their roles in manifesting the various phenotypes of AI. Yes. Yeah. So, AI disorder, tooth decay, or like tooth abnormality development. Mm -hmm. Um, four candidate genes: ENAM, KLK4, MMP20, and FAM83H. Prime. Or mm -hmm. study, uh. Just H. were studied in 50 members of a consanguineous descending from the same ancestor it's definition, I guess, or like related by blood family with a history of AI, 22 affected and 28 unaffected. Um, figure one shows a partial pedigree obtained from the family. Blood samples were collected from all 50 family participants and an additional 50 healthy participants. Okay. Next, DNA was extracted from each blood sample and was subjected to PCR amplification using a pair of primers, DNTP, stack polymerase, and an appropriate buffer. PCR products were separated and visualized on agarose gels. The products were subsequently subjected to direct sequencing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what... Um, so yeah, tell me what this passage is talking about so far. Um, in that first paragraph, though, uh, we see that there's more than one phenotype for AI, right? I see. Like, what are the phenotypes? Um, these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, uh, there's a deficiency in the formation of enamel. There's... Well, I guess 
deficiency in in calcification or tooth maturation, but but yeah, more than one phenotype, right? And yeah. um, and then in the next paragraph, we talk about four of these genes, um, for some of these phenotypes, and um, and then we see like in this family with a history of AI where it's almost like half and half kind of thing, like 22 affected, 28 unaffected. Um, I don't know if it would be half and half or like, I mean, it's not as, it's not like it's three quarters or anything like that. Um, so it seems like it's somewhat close to half and half, but okay. And then we see that there's a partial pedigree from the family. And then they did something where they took blood samples from all of the family participants, so the 22 affected and the 28 unaffected. And then they also collected blood samples from 50 healthy participants. Um, and they extracted DNA from the blood samples and then subjected them to PCR. You're familiar with PCR, right? Um, I guess I would like to go over the process. Mm -hmm. I know that you're, um, yeah, so I would like to go through, like, the specific, I don't know the, how much detail we have to know, but, like, which primers, like, those types of stuff. Yeah, I would say, um, why don't you tell me, like, a very, give me, like, a very basic kind of explanation of PCR. Um, it's so, detailed. I think, like, for PCR, I believe you use, um, like, like what would reverse the... sorry oh like what would the purpose be to identify like specific uh like like genes that are on your sample mm -hmm. so um but why would you need to do pcr to identify genes in your sample because you want to amplify it like you want to have a lot of it to be able to do analysis on them so yeah, that's really the the purpose of it. It's to, because like if you didn't, like before PCR, we would need like a really, really good sample of as much DNA as possible. Um, but in reality, we can only really get kind of fragments of DNA. So what PCR lets you do is, is being able to work with really, really small um, fragments of DNA because you amplify it, making it so you're creating lots and lots of, I guess, copies of that of that fragment. So yeah, uh, what does PCR stand for? Uh, polymerase chain reaction. Yep, yep. Um, and yeah, tell me like, I guess, I guess like the general process, I guess. Like what? Part I'm... Yeah. Uh, it doesn't that's have... a part I'm... <laughs> it doesn't have to be deep. Uh, um, so I have in my mind something about like maybe going from, they might be wrong. Like I'm thinking of reverse transcriptase. I don't know why. Um, of like maybe going from like an RNA and then making the DNA out of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know it's like under like high heat. And like cycles and i know it's like lots of like centrifugation and, and not and like um yeah that's what i have in my mind <laughs> but i don't know the exact steps yeah 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 so what do you think that heat is for um i don't know i i remember reading that they discovered it like with some bacteria that like was in like uh-huh like, like heat heat thermophile. sorry thermophile yeah like, um, because there's different types of extremophiles, like basically bacteria and stuff that can live in extreme conditions. So, um, so a thermophile would be like a bacteria that exists in really, really hot areas. Um, but, and so TAC polymerase is an enzyme from a thermophilic bacteria that functions as a polymerase would function, um, under high heat, but why do we even need the heat? And like, why why go through all the trouble of getting this special polymerase that 
functions well under heat, like heated conditions? Like why not just use a regular polymerase? Mm. Can you speed it up with heat? Because I know like reactions speed up with temperature. So that can always, you know, be something that it does, but um, meaning like heat will generally make things go faster, but, but like, think about like, like, is it really that important for us to make this go faster to the extent that we would have to use this tack polymerase thing that we discovered? Like, think about, think about, I guess, let's say you have a DNA fragment and you want to amplify that. How would you, what would the first thing, what would be the first thing that you would have to do? Oh, is it like separating out my strands? Yep. Like, an, re, uh, yep. I guess the opposite of reannealing. Yep, yep. Uh, exactly. I mean, that's what you see in, I mean, DNA replication, right? That's kind of like, you know, similar to amplification and that you're making more than one DNA strand from a an existing DNA strand. And in order to do that, you need them to um, separate, right? And meaning that you want the two helices to, or the two strands to separate. And then when they're separate, the... Um, so basically, yeah, the heat will make it so that the DNA will, strands will separate. Um, and then the primers would be like something that could be added um, to the separate strands to, to kind of kick it off. And then the DNTPs, what are DNTPs? Don't tell me yet. Um... <laughs> And nucleotide something? Uh-huh. Yeah, so let, let's think about, let's say this is, you know, or I'll make it more like a helis, hel uh, helix. Let's say we have something like that. And, you know, we unravel it. So we get these two separate strands. Um, And then what do we need to do after, right? We need to create the new strands, right? So, you know, um, so let's say, you know, we start with like a primer of some sort just to kind of kick it off. Um, but after that point, you know, let's say we make this strand here, you're going to need to include additional bases to pair with the existing strand right like nucleotides um so dntps are like the little lowercase d is the oxy and then the end part is what can be like adenine you know cytosine uh you know those things um oh i see yeah so yeah so like first we use heat to separate the strands. And then it's kind of like what happens in uh, DNA replication. You get like um, like a primer that is just going to be something that will have like a, a three prime end that's open, like a hydroxyl three prime end, right? And then we can add the, the nucleotides like adenine, thymine, guanine, you know, cytosine. Um, to fill in the the basis for the new strand that you make. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, that's what that stuff is for. So yeah, so the purpose of PCR is to take fragments of DNA that we may not have enough of um and to amplify the fragments meaning we are creating multiple several like 100 or 1000 times the amount of that fragment from from the PCR. Um, yeah. And we use heat to uh, separate the strands. Um, 
And then we use a primer, like we use a primer in DNA replication um, for it to be like a free three prime OH group. And then the DNTPs come in and can be like the bases that come into that new strand. So, okay, cool. Um, so uh, they did that and like they took the DNA um, from the blood samples and then they amplified, I guess, target regions with PCR amplification. And then they separated the PCR products and then they visualized them on agarose gels. And then right after that, they um, sequenced it. So, okay, so that's, so that's that. Now we have a partial pedigree here. Um, pedigree problems can be a little com complex, um, but what do you see, I guess, so far? Uh, males and females get it. Uh-huh, so that would rule out what type of um, um areas. and um with like x or y linked uh mm -hmm. so that would be yep x linked uh -huh. yeah like the the sex linked um types of inheritance um if it yeah if it's x linked recessive um you would see only males um affected but we see both males and females are affected uh in what seems to be you know an equal amount um and we also see kind of like what i was thinking when i when they gave me the numbers like you know i mean like here it's like two thirds right but you know, uh, for like a Punnett square, we're going to have four, you know, genotypes. So this is more like that. It kind of shows that it's half and half. All right. Yeah. So, okay, cool. So we got that. All right. Continue. Um, mutation screening of all candidate genes indicated mutation and resulting phenotype changes for FAM. Eight three H only, so I guess one of of the four genes only one. Uh, analysis revealed the mutation caused a change in a single nucleotide, okay, resulting in replacement of serine with threonine in codon three forty two. Okay, so, um, okay, so they're I guess doing uh some type of thing called a mutation screening of the candidate genes that they mentioned. They mentioned four of them. Um, but they found that, I mean, they found results, I guess, for just the FAM83H gene. Um, and then when they said that it's a change in a single nucleotide, what, what, um, what, uh, do you think about when you see that? Um, well, that's sort of a question <laughs> on the right, I feel. Oh, yeah. I think of that. Uh, and I know it's a missense mutation. Um, I know that, that, like, when it's with a single nucleotide, well, it is apparently causing this. So I, I wouldn't think, you know, when I, when I see, like, serine changing to threonine, I wouldn't, like, have thought it would make such a big effect because it's still sort of, like, same, like, behavior as a, as a, like, a, as a, new, as a, so, like amino acid, but let, it does because it, yeah. So let, let, let's Sorry. forget about the actual, um, what's actually happening in terms of replacement of serine with renin. But when you see a single, a change in a single nucleotide, um, certain things should come up in your head. Um, what kind of things, I guess come up and like don't worry about the question here um just what do you think of when you think of like a mutation that affects a single nucleotide
I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so what could happen? So, so, okay. So let's say we have, um, a single nucleotide and what's happening in this example is a replacement. What else could happen other than replacement? You can delete it. What else? You can insert another. All right. Now, what could be the repercussions of, of those two things? You change the reading frame. Yes. Or you can insert a premature stop codon. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, a single nucleotide, you know, mutation, which can also be called polymorphism, single nucleotide polymorphism. When you see that, I want you to be thinking, this is a very risky mutation, right? Because, I mean, unless it's a substitution, right? It will change the reading frame. So when you see that uh, mutation in a single nucleotide, I want you to be thinking, uh, you know, if it's a replacement, it's fine. But if it's an insertion, if it's a deletion, it will mess things up more likely than it will not mess things up. So, OK, good. Um, all right. Uh, but yeah, now they're saying like just sarin with threonin and yeah i would be thinking like I, I don't know what happens after but i would be thinking what you thought which is that isn't that much of a change right they're pretty similar uh sarin and threonin so uh yeah okay good um good 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 okay continue um different regions and sizes of the fam a3h gene are shown in table one polymorphisms encoding and non-coding regions were identified in in, uh, in the other genes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But mutation screening didn't identify that. Yeah. So I actually don't know really what mutation screening is. So whatever it is seems to only seems to have only found uh, stuff for the FAM 8, 8.3H uh, gene. Um, but now they're talking about uh, the other three genes and apparently there are so yeah so I remember how I said like single nucleotide mutation could also be called polymorphism so we see that here um, and it's saying that these polymorphisms could be found in both the coding and non-coding regions in the rest of these genes. Um, so that's probably going to be the opposite of here because they mentioned phenotype changes for the fam 83h gene, right? And if it's a phenotype uh, change, it would have to be a mutation in a coding region, right? To produce an effect uh, in the phenotype. So, so, so far, like, I don't know what they really mean by mutation screening, but I can see that for the fam 83 h gene, there are mutations that cause changes in the phenotype, which must mean that there are mutations in the coding regions. And then they're telling me that for the other three genes, there's mutations also, like not just in the coding region, but in the non-coding region. So... Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, while all affected individuals carrying the identified mutation in fam 83 h showed very small formations of the teeth, no apparent phenotypic abnormalities were detected in other tissues. Okay, that seems to be uh, only specific to, to the teeth. The length of different regions of fam 83 h gene into the one. Okay. So this is the whole gene okay. as an enhancer region or promoter, five prime n. Um, five prime. Sorry? Oh yeah. So what's the five prime UTR? What is that? Um, I'm thinking of the five prime cap. The five prime cap. Mm -hmm. So why why are you thinking of that? Because it's untranslated. Good. 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 Yep. Okay. 
Um, coding region in trance, coding region in trance. Mm -hmm. Again, again. Yeah, until the three prime end. Uh huh. So and then poly a two. Good. Yeah. So the yeah. So the five prime cap and the poly a tail. What are the functions of those things? It's like uh protecting the um protecting from like degradation or like errors or like um I know it's something about like the um yeah uh -huh. I know it's like protection and I and I know poly a tail specifically has like it shortens over time oh you're thinking, I'm about, thinking like, of that Loma. sorry you're thinking about like telomerase and stuff yeah so uh but yeah so so the for the RNA, like when DNA gets transcribed into RNA, um, to get pre mRNA, what happens? What happens between pre mRNA and mRNA? These things. What uh, I think. Oh, uh, sorry. What things? Like the five, the cap and the tail. Yep. Those are like the sorry. Yeah, why do those things why do those things happen? Um why they happen. Huh? Um the prevents it from degradation, maybe? Mm -hmm. So like let's say this is some RNA and we have this here and then like the poly A tail here. And they're at the ends, so it would protect it from exonucleases. And they're called and these are exonucleases because they would break down things that are at the ends. Um, whereas an endonuclease would break down something not at the end. So something, you know, somewhere in the middle or something like that. So okay, cool. Um Cool. Okay. Yeah. You can continue. Um, yeah. So while only one mutation was identified in the study, further investigation revealed different modes of inheritance and mutation types. For instance, mutations in the ENAM gene inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern were identified in causing more mild AI phenotypes versus mutations in email X and the rest have also been found to contribute to the development of AI. Okay. Okay, so they're saying, okay, let's see. While one mutation was identified in the study, what's that one mutation they identified in the study? Um, this one, 5H3H. Okay, and, and what mutation was it? The, the replacement from serine to threonine. Good, good, good. Um, so yeah, that's the one that they identified in the study. And then when they did some further investigation, they found that there's different modes of inheritance and different types of mutation types. Um, and so for example, mutations in the ENAM gene uh was inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. So that can kind of maybe help us make sense of the pedigree that we saw. Um and also, so that's a different mode of inheritance. Um, and they also found that it caused some mild AI phenotypes, and then, and that's for the ENAM gene, and then mutations in AML X, and all these other seems to be like a couple of new ones here, like WR, yeah. 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 Um, Mutations in those could also contribute to the development of this overall kind of disease. So, okay. So we kind of take that and, you know, so again, we just essentially, you know, went through a, through this passage and we looked at certain buzzwords, like the stuff that essentially I asked you, like, uh, PCR, um, single nucleotide mutations or polymorphisms. And then 
the risks that that involves. Um, and and then the pedigree and the table one, we did our best with you know understanding it so far, but it's not really there isn't really much else we can do unless they ask us questions about it, and that's you know that's how you want to approach that. So okay, cool. Um, all right, so yeah, let's try these questions. No, this is a missense mutation. We okay. What are the these other types? So like removing uh mm -hmm. nonsense is inserting a premature subcode on. Um and frame shift is by like insertion or um delete deletion, I guess. You could get a frame shift, right? Mm -hmm. Um it just uh you can change the reading frame. Mm -hmm. These seem to be like deletion and or insertion would be within the category of frame shift. Um, unless it was, you know, a deletion or insertion of three nucleotides, uh, you would get that. So yeah, so yeah, it's gonna be the miss sense because it's just replacing uh yeah, it's replacing um it, it's substituting one for the other. Um, okay, so yeah, that wasn't bad. Uh, next one. <laughs> Which of the following is most likely true of the five prime UTR region of the fam 838 h gene? A, it is transcribed, but it is typically not translated or is only partially translated. B, it is always both transcribed and translated. C, it is neither transcribed nor translated. D, it is key from the pre-mRNA transcript as part of a post-transcriptional modification. Um, it's not cleaved, it's inserted. Um, sorry, I meant to strike through that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It is neither transcribed nor translated. Um Yeah, so I would go with A, maybe. So let's think, uh, is it? think about the the uh the difference between these choices, right? So first of all, we know that so so I guess this is kind of testing you about because it doesn't the passage doesn't tell you what UTR means. So that's also kind of like a buzz thing. Because yeah. remember when we read it, I asked you what that meant. Yeah. So um, and yeah, and that's exactly what they ask us. So like, I guess this question is meant for people or to test if you know what the UTR, I guess, trans, uh, translates in, or UTR means. Um, so, and you know that it means untranslated region. So you would be able to eliminate, um, B, right? Right. Um, uh, but, um, I guess what's still, uh, messing with me is C because uh, I know it's not translated um, but um, it's a post tra transcriptional modification mm -hmm. does that qualify as like not being transcribed or is it or is it transcribed so um, so if it's I guess we want to ask ourselves is, is this going to be present so let's go back to that um that figure. I mean the one up, uh, after this. Yeah, this one. So so I talked about this in terms of the RNA, right? With after like transcription, the RNA would have that five cap and the poly A tail. Uh but table one is is this table one for RNA? Sorry, what was your question? Oh yeah, so um, is table one showing us stuff for RNA? Um, so there. Um, no, is it? Huh. 
Because um, I see introns, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what's that? So you mentioned the five cap, the polyA tail. What else happens between pre-mRNA and mRNA? Um, you're transporting it out to the cytoplasm. Oh, well, like, so like, you know, for instance, like in the nucleus, the DNA will be translated into RNA, um, which we can call pre-mRNA. So what happens between the pre-mRNA and the mRNA? Because when it, once it turns into mRNA, it can leave the nucleus. So you mentioned the five. So isn't like those modifications, like what's happening to the, to make it from like pre mRNA to RNA? Yeah. Is there something else? Yeah. There's a the question. Thing. So you, you mentioned the five cap and the poly A tail, which protect, you know, the ends of the, of the mRNA, but there's another thing that happens and it's related to what you said about introns. Um, Well, if it's related to introns, then it has to be like splicing out the introns. Yeah. Yep. But um. So that's what happens. Yeah. yeah. So so because basically when you transcribe uh DNA into so like roughly two percent of DNA is code it like would code for something. Mm -hmm. So when we turn when you transcribe DNA into RNA. Right. It's it's still going to be 98 percent, you know, introns. Right. Uh, or non coding stuff. Right. So. But when it goes from the maybe I'll put like pre mRNA here to actual mRNA, it gets the molecule gets significantly smaller because uh, the mRNA is only going to be comprised of coding like uh, like nucleotides that code for something. So like, let's say that this DNA is like 100 something units. Um, when you turn it into the RNA, it'll also be that same amount, let's say 100 units. But when it turns into the mRNA, it should be, let's say, two, a unit of two. Because, yeah, because you are getting rid of the introns, right? So what we see in table one, we see that there's introns. So this stuff, so what we see here are uh, is not the mRNA here. This is just the gene itself, uh, meaning like the DNA itself. So uh, so what we must look at here is, I guess, what happens when this gene turns into the mRNA? And what happens is the introns will be spliced out. Um, the enhancer and promoter, like that stuff will start like that transcription process but it won't really be included in the uh, mRNA, the, the, yeah, the mRNA that you get, but this will be included. The coding regions, which we can really think of as exons, will remain. Um, and then the poly A tail, I'm, I'm pretty sure the three prime UTR will exist as well. So, um, so yeah, so this is going to be something that, so we know that uh, it won't be translated based on the name. Um, and then we have C that says it's not translated, which is true, but it says that it's not transcribed either, right? And then, yeah. Yep. I mean, I guess for me, it's really, because I always like, I didn't know that like DNA had a Paul VA tail and um uh, uh -huh. and uh, what's it called and the five five prime cap already like I guess it's already in in the sequence uh -huh. oh okay 
I see. Oh, oh, sorry. When you say that, uh, tell me what you mean. When you said it's already in sequence. Like, um, like in the strands of DNA, you have something that will become like the five prime untranslated region. Yeah, yeah. That will, yeah. So, you know, I guess if you didn't know that, um, it, you would know that just from this information here. Because we know that this is, because, yeah, same thing when I looked at it. I looked at it as the RNA molecule. So I drew the five cap and the poly A tail. Um, but since there's introns in table one, it cannot be the mRNA. So it must mean that this DNA or this gene will still have certain um, base pairs, you know, in, in the poly A tail and stuff. Uh, but yeah, so, okay, we can get rid of B because we know that UTR means untranslated region. Um, C says what is true, which is it's not translated, but it says also that it's not transcribed. Um, A says that it is transcribed, but not translated or is partially translated. So that's a little better. And then D says it is cleaved from the pre-mRNA transcript as part of a post-transcriptional modification. So the post-transcriptional modifications will be the three things that we talked about, like the splicing, um, the five cap tail, the poly A tail, or five cap, yeah, and the poly A tail. So, you know, so even though we see some five prime UTR and a poly A tail, which might, indicate it's going from pre-mRNA to mRNA, uh, the presence of the introns here means that it's not um, it's not going to be like uh, what we, like it's, this is not representing the pre-mRNA or the you know, the RNA that gets, like it's not get, representing this right? Because we have, um, because because what D is essentially saying is that is is this kind of step from the pre-mRNA to the mRNA. That's where the post-transcriptional modifications are happening. Um, so, so yeah, I guess I guess we our options are it's transcribed but not translated. Um. That's out. Uh, it's neither transcribed nor translated, or it's just something that in this process from the pre-mRNA to the mRNA, it's cleaved off. It's just cut, cut away. So, um, so yeah, we. Uh, so yeah, what what would I guess? What would you? What were your what? I guess. Yeah, what would you, yeah, I guess tell me like what you would do to figure out, I guess, uh, between A, C, and D. Um, well, from D for me, I knew like it's, it's not a post transcriptional modification. So I like trying to strike through, but I was going to delete, like it stopped, like, for me, it's not an option. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was between A and C. But knowing that um, it's part of DNA, like the, the untranslated region, I know it has to be transcribed first um, into, into the RNA. Mm -hmm. um, so I would go with A. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so, okay. Uh, so yeah, from the name, we know that it's not translated. So B is out. And then the question is, is it transcribed or not? There's nothing telling, or there's nothing indicating that it's not transcribed. So we can't really say that it's not transcribed. Um, but yeah, you're, you're 
thinking is correct here. Great. So hmm? Should we move on to the next one? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, pregnant couple is worried that their child will develop AI. The respective pedigree is shown below. What is the probability that the first child of this couple will develop non-ENAM related AI? Oh, wait, non-ENAM. ENAM is the autosomal dominant. Mm -hmm. But it's non-ENAM related, so not autosomal dominant. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess this would be like it's maybe autosomal recessive. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> um so if it's a recessive, I would need uh of this couple. Oh, of that couple. Okay. So if it's recessive, it means that you would need I'm thinking it's recessive. I may be completely off here. Um you would need both copies in order to uh have the mutation or like the symptoms, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um And I'm thinking because these siblings have it that perhaps they are heterozygous. These two, the, the two parents would be heterozygous is my thought process. Mm -hmm. And they're not displaying it because it has to be recessive is my thought process. I don't know. Um, and so you're having two heterozygous, like what's the probability of having a recessive phenotype mm -hmm. uh, is my thought. Um, and I mean... I can do the. You see sorry, the, you see the pedigree on the left. Okay. So. Uh, let's see. So, okay, pregnant couple is worried that their child will develop AI. The respective uh pedigree is shown below. What is the probability that the first child of this couple will develop? non-enam related ai um okay and then they mentioned that enam was the what um autosomal uh dominant right yeah okay so let's see my logic is failing me because there isn't an option for a fourth. So I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's see. Um, so it seems like we might be getting something like. So you mentioned. Okay. So. So, all right, you said something about autosomal, what was it, recessive? Is that something you were talking about? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so yeah, let's think about that, right? Um, I just want to see down in the passage where it mentioned the autosomal dominant thing. Okay um mutations in the enam okay is autosomal dominant so now they're asking about non-enam which i guess we can say is autosomal recessive but let's okay let's see what we see in the pedigree so we see that the two parents um well i guess up here grandparents or whatever uh don't have it but half of like the kids have it um so that could be an autosomal um recessive condition because you know if it was dominant the heterozygous like grandparents up here uh should should be affected right yeah so okay so let's say that we think of uh this as autosomal recessive um okay and then it seems like half 
of the offspring here for both of these, uh, you know, are are affected. So they should have, like, I guess, two copies of the like recessive, you know, allele. Um, mm -hmm. and then these ones would be, I guess heterozygous just like uh yeah so i i think my math is failing me because like i mean if i try to do a punnett square i don't have any of the options but if it's just simple pattern tracking it has to be a half yeah i was going to say yeah. that um and i think i was thinking that like when we first i think the thing that we saw like on the left up top forgot what it was all, all the way up top because they mentioned, yeah, this over here. So, uh, yeah, because remember when we were reading that, I was saying this is looks like it's kind of like half and half. Like, mm -hmm. even though 22, like 28 is more than 22, uh, it's not like, you know, like we did that other problem the other day where I don't, I think it was like 21, 9 or something like that, which indicates uh, some numbers or something. I think we did something like this where it was like a clear like three one ratio kind of thing. But this seems to be half, right? So that's what I would do. So here we see that, you know, these two guys have to be um, heterozygous and, you know, two are affected, half of them are affected and half of these ones are affected. So I think, I think, yeah, I think you're right with, with uh, it being like a 50%, um, 50, uh, like a, yeah, half of them. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Nice. How, how did you go about this, like the first time around? Um, I think I tried to look at this. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I ended up choosing like maybe it was B one ninth. I'm not sure what I selected. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. So it seems like, you know, we could say that, uh, so if this is an autosomal recessive condition, then the affected parent well i guess we don't really have affected parents here but if there was an affected parent it would always pass on that mutant allele because if it's affected it would have the two you know uh recessive alleles uh whereas the carrier would have a 50 percent chance of passing on that mutant allele and a 50% chance of passing on the normal allele. And, and, and yeah, so like we essentially have these. So these should have the same genotypes as these. And if these genotypes produce half affected, yeah, it'll be half. Yeah. So, yeah. See it now. Mm -hmm. um, okay. In the first trial of the PCR procedure, only one primer was added to the mixture. What was the most likely outcome during that during this trial? Um, yeah, I got this wrong, and I remember. I know that when I was answering this, um, I chose B. Okay. Um. I mean, I guess this just comes out and this is why I wanted to review like PCR because like, I don't know why it's not B or uh or like, yeah. Okay, so generally speaking, let's say we have, maybe I'll use some colors here. Let's see, I'll use, I'll start with black or let me do it like this. And then like, let's separate these. And let's say blue is going to be like the new whatever uh, strand. 
kind of like that. And then these would separate into like black, black, blue, blue, and let's say green is the next one. So that's going to be here. That's going to be there like that. And uh, this, this is effectively just doubling um, the strands uh, each time, right? Because we have um, we have two strands here, we have four strands here, right? One, two, three, four. And here we have 16 strands, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, eight, sorry. Eight strands, but then you'd see after that 16 strands, right? So if it's doubling every time, what type of what type of um growth is that? I see. So uh if it's doubling, then it has to be linear. Um well, let's think about what a graph of that would look like. Like let's say one, two, uh two, three, like this x-axis could be the number of uh times it like splits, like with this being one, this being two, this being three. Um, so at one, let's say it's like two. And at two, it's four. And at three, it's eight. And then at four, it'll be all the way at 16. So this, 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 let's say four here, all the way here. It's a... Uh, that right yeah so uh -huh. but that's the thing that's what i thought like i thought it would be exponentially amplified oh yeah so i'm not talking yet about the question i just mean regularly speaking oh okay like regularly speaking it should be giving you an exponential uh growth right so okay now uh, because each time, like the slope essentially is cha like changing each time. Um, so, okay, that would be what happens if everything's going right. Now, let's say we have something where one primer was added. So that would look like, let's see, I'll do something like this. That. And... If they said that only one primer was added, that could mean that only one of the strands would be, I guess. Okay, okay, I see what you're saying. So, so, okay. So, they can't be both of the strands being linearly amplified right because uh because if we're just using one primer um the one that the strand that actually gets to use the primer will grow exponentially so it can't be, we know that it can't be both linear. We know that it can't be both exponential, right? So uh, there's no choice for both exponential, but there's a choice for both linear and we know that can't be it, right? Okay, so now from here, what else can we get rid of? PCR amplification was unable to proceed. Well, you have one of the two primers that you need. So part of it will proceed, right? So D should be out. And now it's a question of, is it only one strand that's exponentially amplified, which would happen if it had that primer, um, like if any of the strands had a primer, it would be exponentially amplified. And if a strand did not have a primer, it won't be exponentially amplified. So we just have to think, you know, is it going to be one strand that is uh, exponentially amplified or one strand that is linearly amplified? So how can we 
determine that if you only have um, one primer instead of two. I guess would that mean that in each replication, instead of like each one giving you two, each one would be giving you one? Yep. So instead of something like this here, right, we would just get something like that. And then this can separate into black and blue, and then we can use green for just that, right? And so this means that we have, we start with two strands, and then we have three strands total. Um, and then we have one, two, three, and then this one is the same. So wait, one, two, three, four, right? Strands total. So we know that this will produce um, like linear amplification um, for the the situation when you have just one primer. Okay, I see. Yeah, because because it can either be only one will be exponentially amplified, or or only one can be, or only one would be linearly amplified. So. The really tricky part is to understand uh, which which it will actually be, um, but you're going to need both of the primers for it to be exponentially amplified. So, because that's how you get the doubling each time because of the pair of uh, primers uh, means that you're doubling it every time, which is the exponential amplification. But uh, if we only have one primer you're not, it's not going to be like one gets amplified exponentially and one gets linearly amplified. It means that it'll, it'll essentially uh, come down to it being linearly amplified. I see. It's like this, this entire route here is going to be a constant number of one instead of, I see. yeah. Yeah. So this should be, I think one strand is uh, linearly amplified. Hmm? I see it now. Yeah. It, very tricky, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Assuming no alternative splicing occurs, approximately how many base pairs will be in a mature mRNA produced from the FAM83H gene? So we talked about splicing, but what is alternative splicing? Um, when you like leave some introns or, or not, I, I think like when you, um, you create variation with this. So let's say we had exon one, exon two, exon three, exon four. Um, I didn't draw the introns, but let's say we have these exons. So uh, alternative splicing would be um, splicing these uh, exons together, like not exactly in this way. So you can have exon one, exon three, exon four. You could have exon two. You can have exon four. You can have, you know, exon one, exon four, right? You could have these different. Oh, th is it only of coding regions? Oh, well, the coding regions would be the exons, right? Yes. Um, it's just that the co like coding region, so let's say this is exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, exon 4, exon 5, right? And you're in your you can splice it to be in like essentially any combination of these. So you can have exon so you can have x all so you can have exon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all of them in your mRNA. Um, but you can also just have exon one, exon three, exon five. You can have 
any of these combinations. So splicing itself is just getting rid of the introns and splicing the exons together. But alternative splicing allows you to have uh, splice different exons together in, I don't want to say different order, because it's not like exon four will be before exon one. But you don't need to have all of the exons spliced in. You can have uh, partial ones spliced in. And that's how you can get uh, I um, forgot the word. It's like iso isoforms. Like if this was for for a protein or whatever, um, these would be different isoforms. Um, I yeah. Uh, you. This is something that you see like when you think about like the antibodies. Um, like these are the variable regions that change depending on what particular pathogen that antibody is made for. And it's variable region because it's going to be very different based on whatever it needs to, you know, what antigen or whatever it needs to attack or attach to. Um, and that's, that variation is caused by alternative splicing. So that's another context that you might see this in. Um, but but yeah, so they're telling us, assuming no alternative splicing, right? So what does that mean? That means that we're going to be using all of the exons. Because if it was alternative splicing, you don't need to use all of the exons. So if alternative splicing occurs, we can't really answer this question, right? Because like, for instance, this, could be like, you know, however many base pairs long. And that's different from this, different from that, right? So, so yeah, if, if alternative splicing occurred, we would not be able to answer this question. But they're saying, let's say no alternative splicing occurs. That means all of the exons remain. And we can answer the question of how many base pairs will be in, you know, a uh, mature mRNA that comes from this gene. So, yeah, what do you think? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, what I would... Oh, I see. So, is it just adding them? Yep, I would, I would add them um, and see if that lines up with anything, and then I'll go from there. So let's try that. Let's try 300, 250, 150, 180, 200. So. 1,080, but that's not an option. Yeah, so that's what I would do first. And then from there, I would think about adding uh, the other stuff that would be present in the mRNA, right? So poly A tail. Uh Five yeah. prime uh, UTR, I think three prime UTR, but let's see, right? So five prime UT, uh, UTR one thirty, poly A tail one forty, so this would be two seventy. So add that to the ten eighty will be twelve eighty plus the seventy thirteen fifty. So we can get rid of. A. I think What's I up? would go maybe B if it includes all that. So let's see what we can include from there. So the, I added the 5 UTR and the poly A tail. So I'm going to add the 3 prime UTR now, and then that would be 1440. And I know the enhancer won't be there. I know the promoter won't be there, and I know the introns won't be there. So 1440, right? Or 1440. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. OK. I see. Mm -hmm. I get it. Yeah. I was also just tricked by this very dumb, silly mistake. But like when they say base pairs, in my mind, I was thinking, like, should I be thinking like hydrons and like amino acids and things like this? Got but it. no, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, because it's asking about the uh, in the mature mRNA. So, you know, codons and anti-codons like start to be a thing in translation. Uh, but they're just asking, yeah, what would be in the mature mRNA? So, yeah, that's where I just started with what I know. So I know the coding regions will be in it. So I added up the coding regions here and we got 1080 and that's smaller than all the choices. So we can't rule anything out. So then I went with what else would be in the mature mRNA. And I know the five prime UTR would be in it. And I know the poly A tail would be in it. And then that got us uh, 1350 and that's enough to eliminate A. And then what else could be in the mature mRNA? And I wasn't sure that the three prime UTR would be, but 1350 isn't going to be, it isn't an answer choice. So then I tried, okay, let's add the three prime UTR and we get 1440. And that lines up with something. And it can't be more than that because I know that the mature mRNA does not have the introns, right? And it shouldn't have the, if I, even if I was not sure about the enhancer and promoter, 1440, if I add 40 and 30, like 70 to that, right? That'll be 1510. And there's nothing close to that either. Yeah. There's nothing. So, so 1441 would be it. But, Pardon. but yeah, I want you to be able to see like in table one that coding region equals equates to exon and the intron well that's just intron right um and then this conditional of no alternative splicing i see hmm? that's good yep all right and so alternative splicing like mm -hmm. this is um different from splicing out introns um it, it's essentially just splicing but splicing not all it, it, splicing together like less than a hundred percent of the exons and more than like one of the exons okay so, yeah sounds good i just want to make sure like introns are not in this like when we're doing this like they're already out or like we're not including it so from the uh dna so like if you did the math whatever let's see 200 plus 350 let's say um for 500 here uh 635 plus the 70 so like, um, whatever, 700. So um, if you added everything, oh, I, I, uh, that's 700 plus the 1440, I guess. So I guess that would be like 2000 something. So that's if you have everything, right? So um, you just want to think about, I guess, yeah, what, what happens between the, so like when the DNA gets transcribed into into the RNA it's the RNA is an exact replica of the DNA except you know you have uracil instead of the thymine but the size is going to be the same but what happens between RNA which we can call pre mRNA and actual mRNA is what will help you answer the question which is alternative well Splicing does not have to be alternative splicing, but splicing, which means you're getting rid of the introns, keeping the exons, um, and then the 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 stuff at the ends of the mRNA to protect it from exonucleases. Okay. Yep. Okay, sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Awesome. Oh, not bad. Not not that bad of a passage, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Especially because. Again, like, you know how we like go through this and when we see the pedigree, it could be like, oh, there's so many things happening. But at the end of the day, you just need to answer the questions. And that means we don't have to understand everything. Yeah. We're, we're just 
having we're, we just have to answer the questions at the end of the day so uh so as you read the passage right we didn't spend an excessive amount of time analyzing the pedigree that they gave us we didn't spend an excessive amount of time on any of that stuff we just read the passage we understood what we could understand um there's those buzzwords we talked about that likely will be asked about and that's exactly what came to pass like they asked us about the things that we talked about with the buzzwords so yeah so a lot of this just involves getting psychologically i guess i don't want to say like resistant but psychologically like uh able to tolerate hard looking passages um and not let it psych you out and to still just get the job done which is just answering the questions because that you, the hardest passage is still going to be like five, six, seven questions, you know, and it'll be stuff mm -hmm. that won't be really at, like crazy or anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Good job. So tomorrow, same time? Yes. Okay. Um. Yep. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Good job today. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. All right. Take Bye. Care.